Thank you, Jeremy and praise team. Good morning, everybody. Great to have you all here in worship. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. I would remind you once again that there is a devotional guide for you each and every week based upon the message. And that's to help you live with the message during the week. It's something you can use individually or in a group. Questions to ponder, scripture to reflect on. It can be a useful resource for you. And so we hope you'll take advantage of that. I do have a text of scripture I want to read for you today. Imagine that. It comes from uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, and this is the Apostle Paul waxing poetic about the church in a very profound way. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we're all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, Every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. May the Lord add his blessing upon this reading of his holy word. Help us to hear it, understand it, believe it, and then live in response to it. Let's be an attitude of prayer together. Eternal God, we do thank you for the gift of another day of worship in this This church, this wonderful congregation coming together, we thank you for the gift of fellowship and the prayers, the music, the support. Oh, Lord, it is a gift. And now, Lord, you have given to me the amazing privilege and responsibility of preaching your word to these my friends and your servants, Lord, a task I always need your strength in order to do. So, Lord, please speak to me and through me in such a way that all of us do receive a word from you that will make a difference to our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. And all of God's people said. Now, when you drove to church today, you passed by the houses of neighbors and friends who had no thought of going to church. Some were sipping their coffee and scrolling through Facebook on their phones. Some were still asleep. Some were headed to the golf course or helping their kid get ready for a soccer game. Why aren't they here? Why don't they go to church? You know, the irony is there are religious polls that are given all the time in America. And those polls reveal something very interesting, that a large percentage of Americans believe in God. They they are spiritual. And some even say they go to church. So where in the heck are they? You know, we know that the post-COVID church is interesting, that there are many people who used to go to church, but then COVID hit, and after COVID, they got out of the habit, and now it's much more comfortable to get up, stay in your PJs, stay on the couch, and watch worship. It's comfortable that way. And their thinking is, well, I've gone this long without going to church in person, Maybe I'll just spend the weekend doing something I really enjoy. After all, is it really that important? I can always catch a service online. Now, you and I have heard several excuses and reasons for people not going to church. And today, I have a treat for you. I'm going to lift up the top reasons I've heard why people say they don't go to church and respond to them. Now, listen, this is a special sermon. This is your sermon because I'm very much aware I'm preaching to the choir. Amen? (laughs) You're here. Give yourselves a hand. 
So my hope is that this message equips you to respond to folks who criticize the church, who say they don't want to come to church, and you can share with them why the church is so important to you and why it should be important to other people. So strap in. We're going for a ride, folks, okay? Number one, so you've ever heard this one. I believe in God. I'm spiritual. I just don't believe in organized religion. Anybody ever heard that one? And if I'm in a mood, this is what I often say. You don't believe in organized religion. As opposed to what? Unorganized religion? <laughs> the truth is, unorganized religion is no match for organized evil. And believe me, evil is out there and it is organized. How can the church make a difference if we're not organized? I mean, when there is a hurricane or a natural disaster, we expect FEMA and the Red Cross to be organized, don't we? When there is a threat to our country, we expect the military to be organized, don't we? When we go to Publix, we expect it to be organized. <laughs> and oftentimes, it is in a great way. When we go to the hospital, we expect it to be organized. Yet, when the Church of Jesus Christ, the most important institution in the world, that has the most important job in the world, gets organized, people have a problem with that. I just don't get it. Given the sufferings of this present world and the job that God has called the church to do, we should be the most organized institution in the world. And a close reading of history will show, and listen closely, a close reading of history will show that when God does anything significant in this world, he does it through his church, not through politics, not through talk radio, not through secular institutions. He does it through his church. When the world is at its worst, the church needs to be at its best. And that means the church should be organized. So scratch that one off. Let's go to the next one. I only have 35 today, okay? Just kidding. I love this one. And you got to say it just right. Number two, the church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. You got to say it like that, okay? And I love this one. I really do. I really love this one. In fact, in every church I've served, if I get into the community and I'm at a barber shop or some, some place where most people don't know me and they start talking about this, because it's common. You know, I'll go to church because of a bunch of hypocrites. I know Sally, she goes to that church and acts all holy, but I know what she does during the week, yada, 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 you know? And, and when they start talking like that, I love it because I hear them. I said, yeah, yeah, you're right about that. You know, that church down the road, and I reference the church I'm serving. I know, I know the biggest hypocrite of that church. I do. And their eyes get real big. You want me to tell? Want me to tell you? Yeah, yeah, tell us. It's me. <laughs> My name's Charlie Reeb, and I'm the senior pastor. Hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> it's true. This is a popular one. You know, maybe you have a, a neighbor or a relative that comes over during the holidays and you have dinner and, and they criticize the church at the dinner table and they always bring up the same litany of stuff. You know, the Salem witch trials, the inquisition, the corruption of clergy. I mean, they have a whole list and they discover to their surprise that the church is made up of imperfect people. They talk about how the, their fingers got caught in the machinery of the church, maybe, and how they got angry with someone or someone got angry with them on a committee. What a surprise. And they discovered that the church is imperfect. Let me let the cat out of the bag for you, folks. The church is imperfect. It is filled with imperfect people because the church is not a museum for saints. It is a hospital for sinners. There's no such thing as the perfect church, but quite often... There will be people who are searching for the perfect church. And every pastor knows these people. Riley, you know them well, don't you? You know them well. <laughs> and, they'll and they're not talking about people who are church shopping. We're talking about people who don't want to communicate and have a connection. They want to interview you. And so they have a list of questions, 20 or 25, making sure you're the perfect church, you know? And I always tell them the same thing. Listen, I want to tell you, there's no such thing as the perfect church. But then I tell them this. But let me tell you this, if you find a perfect church and join it, it won't be perfect anymore. <laughs> For some reason, they don't like hearing that. I don't know why. And then I tell them, listen, there's no such thing as the perfect church. Stop 
searching for the perfect church. Go and worship a perfect God with a community of believers who need just as much God's graces as they do and you do. We're all flawed. We're all imperfect. I mean, that's why the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, we have this treasure in clay jars. We have this treasure, this church of Jesus Christ, this body of Christ through earthen vessels to show that the power comes from God, not from us. And even though the church is not perfect, I'll tell you this, the church is still the greatest thing God has going for him in this world. And if God's going to do anything significant in this world, he's going to do it through his church, through our imperfections. The love and grace of God is revealed. So the next time someone comes up to you and talks about hypocrites and hypocrites, the church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites, you have my permission to say this. Yes, you are right, and there's always room for one more. (laughs) I'm here to preach today, folks, all right? Number three, here we go. I love this one. Oh, I love this one. I can experience God on the golf course or in the mountains or on the beach. Listen, I have doubts about this one because I'm a golfer. And most of the time when I golf, God is far from me on the golf course. (laughs) I mean, see some of the shots I hit, you know. But, you know, number three is a popular one. You know, I hear it quite a bit and I have no doubts about it. It's true. You can't experience God on a mountain, on a beach, on a golf course but sooner or later in life. You're going to need the love and the connection and the community of the church. And where do you go when you need that? I've never heard of a golf course that saved a marriage. Now I know a lot of golf courses that have ruined marriages. (laughs) I never have heard of a mountain that helped a person overcome an addiction. I've never heard of a, of a beach or a boat that helps someone gain a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. But I know the church has done all those things. I mean, what happens after the events like 9-11 or a mass shooting or some major crisis? Where do people flock to? Do they go to the mountains? Do they go to the beach? Do they go to the golf course? No, they flock to the church because they are desperate for the love and the compassion of people. And most of all, they are desperate for a power and a strength beyond themselves. And they don't know the church is the only place that can help them. The church is the only place that can offer it to them. I mean, the questions are always the same, aren't they? Why do bad things happen to good people? Where is God when it hurts? What's the meaning and purpose of my life? What is the will of God? Where do you find answers to those questions except the church of Jesus Christ? We need each other. Barbara Brown Taylor, that great preacher, talks about a friend of hers who's 97 years old and she has has memory issues and her long-term memory is great. Her short-term memory is not so much, but she remembers the time she and her friends when, when she was a kid went to Mount Washington in New Hampshire and climbed that mountain. And they had a great time. They were there all day, but they stayed too late because the darkness came in rather quickly and they were terrified. There were no flashlights. And so they decided to take one another's hands and form a human chain down that mountain. Sometimes they debated where to go, left or right or straight, but they never let go of one another. Then the lady concluded and said, sometimes it was so dark that I could only see the hand in front of me and the hand behind me. We got down that mountain because we held on to each other. Now, if that's not a parable for the church of Jesus Christ, I don't know what is. We need each other to navigate those dark times. We need each other to gain wisdom as we go through life. We need each other because we are not strong to follow Jesus Christ on our own. We need the church, and the church needs us. So scratch that one off. Here's another one. I love this one. Oh, I love this one. I can be a Christian without going to church. Have you ever heard that one before? Charles, I can be a Christian without going to church. Sure you can, but not a very good one. <laughs> can you be married and never live with your spouse? Yeah, but you won't stay married long. Amen? 
Can you be a member of a gym and never go? Yeah, people do it all the time, but they're not very healthy. (laughs) Can you be a member of a team and never go to practice? Heck yeah, but you're going to let the team down on game day. Of course. I don't know any Christian who is active and growing in the faith, who's not rooted in a church. In fact, I would challenge you. I dare you to find me a healthy, growing, vital Christian who's not rooted in a local church. You can't find it. We need more than people who think just like us. We need people to stretch us. Because quite often our default mode, and I don't know if this sounds familiar, but our default mode is to go into our echo chambers and just surround ourselves with people who think like us, who act like us. We need the church to stretch us. Besides, there is no such thing as an isolated Christian. That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about in the passage I read to you. He was basically saying, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are automatically part of the church. There is no loophole. There is no way out of it. You are grafted into the body of Christ. And in fact, what he's really saying is when you decide to be a Christian, you are put on the team and given a position. And so sure, one can decide not to be active in a church, but basically what they're doing is this. They're sitting on the bench and they're refusing to contribute to the team. That's what they're doing. You see, being a Christian is like being a grit. You can't get just one, you know? You can't just order one grit, amen, those from the South? (laughs) They all come together, don't they? As Paul says, if one part suffers, All of it suffers. If one part is honored, everyone rejoices. So the next one. Oh, this is a doozy. I can just worship online. Now I have a few disclaimers here, okay? I don't want to get letters. I have a few disclaimers. I love, we have a great online community. There are many people joining us online right now and we love you and we we have a great ministry being online. And I'm well aware, well aware that there are people who because of health reasons and and other reasons cannot come to worship in person. And, And I totally get that. I also know that worshiping online is better than not worshiping at all. Also know that the reality is the post-COVID church, we are an in-person and online community, and that's just the reality. And so we better offer meaningful ministries of being online, of having the internet going and having worship all the time. We have to do that. Also know that our online presence is our shake hand of the community, our handshake. And as we do that, Sometimes people will check us out online and based upon what they experience, you know, I got to, I got to check that church out. But I also know, I also know that there are people who can and should be here in person who are not because in their minds, they think it's the same thing. And I tell you, nothing could be further from the truth. As someone once said, you can't serve from the sofa. You can't be a community of faith on the sofa. You can't experience the power of worshiping together on the sofa. We're not consumers, we're contributors. We don't watch, we engage as Christians. We give, we serve, we sacrifice. The church needs you and you need the church. So yes, you can worship Jesus anywhere. The spirit of Jesus is anywhere. You don't need to be in a place like this or a sanctuary to worship. But I tell you what every Christian does need, what we all need, and that is this. We need, we must worship with other people. All kinds of people. Old people, young people, middle-aged people. People who think and maybe vote differently than us. People that we can challenge, people who can challenge us, people we can encourage, people who can encourage us. You know, and I tell you, 
the truth is, and we need to hear this, the church is the only institution left in this polarized world where people can come and experience all ages, all generations. You name me one other organization in the world where someone can come in and experience the wisdom of an older generation uh, or the wisdom of young people and come in and, and be mixed and, and have a great time learning from everyone. Isn't that beautiful? It's the only institution left where someone can experience that. You need the church, and I need the church, and we need it because following Jesus Christ in this world is tough. Amen? And we can't do it alone. And, and, and what's more is this. There are special, powerful things that happen when we're face to face. Like we need to hug each other and, and shake one another's hands. We need to look one another in, in the face and ask how life is. Sometimes we need to go up to a person and say, how are you doing? Do, do you need to talk? Do you need prayer? That cannot happen looking at a screen. And I'll tell you this, I was talking to a member of this church recently, and they confessed to me, this nice family, the father, he said, Pastor Charlie, I have to confess, you know, we were one of those COVID churchgoers, you know, we got used to worshiping online and got out of the habit and we filled our Sundays with other activities and, and we thought, well, you know, this is nice, this is convenient and, and it's pretty much the same. But then he said, but Pastor Charlie, I have to confess, there's something missing. It's not the same. He said, I don't feel grounded anymore. My kids aren't grounded anymore. We're making bad choices. We're coming back. We miss it. And let me tell, tell you this, those who are worshiping online and those who are members of this church, you know who you are. We need you. We need you. And you need the church. We need Jesus and we need his church. So here's the last one. This is probably my all-time favorite one. <laughs> the church is always asking for money. Ever heard that one? Oh, yeah, that's my, that's, that's my, that's my all-time favorite one. You know why? Because this is my favorite one to respond to. I have such a good time, right, Riley? It's awesome. It's like in Georgia, you know, they're big bulldog fans. How about them dogs? I'm glad I'm not in Georgia anymore, but anyway. <laughs> Sorry, Georgia fans. But anyway, when, when they do this, you know, when, when, when I hear them say that, you're just always asking for money, money, money. And I know they went to Georgia. I always say this, and I, and I know this, but I ask them, tell me, where did, you, where did you go to college? They say, oh, we went to Georgia. How about them dogs? Roof, 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 roof. You know, and I say, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's wonderful. Hey, let me ask you something. Whenever you are going to the football game and you're cheering on the team, go dogs, or whenever you're moving your, your son or daughter into the, the dorm freshman year, let me ask you, have you ever said, this school is always asking for my money? Oh, I'm preaching now, aren't I? Or, when, or whenever you get a letter, I say, or an email that encourages you to, to contribute to the football program or boosters, have you ever said, this place is always asking for my money? Or when the Girl Scouts come running with their cookie sheets, <laughs> do you ever say, those girls are always asking for my money? Never. We'll down a sleeve of Thin Mints in one sitting, <laughs> boldly. I've done it. You're in church, be honest. <laughs> Yet when the church of Jesus Christ, the most important institution in the world that has the most important job in the world to be vessels of God's love and care and grace asks for money, people have problems with it. Help me understand that. I will never apologize. I will never apologize for boldly asking people to contribute their resources to the church because we're the only bank account God has. 
And when people don't contribute, something God wants done does not get done. And I know this, deep down, there are many of you, if not all of you in worship today, who feel the same way. Deep down, you want to be part of a church that's making a difference in this community for Christ. Deep down, you want to be part of a church that's transforming lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Deep down, you want that. Because you know the church is the only organization that can do what it's called to do. I have a colleague who remembers being in San Juan, Mexico. He was in the airport. He was, he was waiting for you know, his flight and he was at the gate. And he watched this eight-year-old and six-year-old kid just beating each other up. I mean, they were just all over the floor. One was pounding the kid's head into the ground. And I mean, it was awful. And, he's, and he was thinking, where are these, where are the parents? The parents were nowhere to be found. Where are the parents? And it got worse and worse and worse, this fight. And so finally, my colleague decided to get up and split up the fight. And he, he separated them. And he began to ask as he separated them, where are their parents? Aren't there, aren't there programs and in, in the government here that can help these kids? Aren't there schools and, and, and counselors that can help these kids? Aren't there places of business that can give these kids jobs when they get older and help them? And then my colleague said this to himself. Who but God can transform a human being? Who but God can transform these kids? It would take a miracle to give these kids a chance. Only God can transform. And then he said this. Why is the church always waiting on somebody else to do its job? Why the church? Because God has called us to do a job that no one else can do. And when we don't do it in this world that is suffering so bad, it's not going to get done. Why go to church? Because deep down, you desire to connect with real loving people. Because deep down, you desire to connect to a real loving God. And because deep down, you want to help others make that life-changing connection too. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this, this church, Church Universal and this, this local church that does so much. I thank you for those who are here. I know I'm, I'm preaching to your choir, Lord. They know it. But sometimes it's good to be reminded. Lord, and I, I pray for those who can be here and we just, we miss them. We miss their smiles. We miss their service. We miss their ministries. We miss their laughter. We miss the ways they make us laugh and the, the way they challenge us. We miss their contributions. Oh, Lord, lead them back by your grace and your spirit. Lord, we pray all these things in your name. Amen.